So there is interdependence, and we recognise this, and there's particularly independence in the environment and development spheres. That's very clear. And that produces this imperative that we must cooperate. However, states are balancing that against imperatives that lead them to seek power and to compete economically. And until we can balance uh, or rebalance this so that the imperative to cooperate becomes stronger, states are just going to continue this behaviour. And like I say, they've been saying they'll change this and they've been recognising they absolutely need to change this for 40 years and they've not moved very far along that road. Um, am I sure how this will happen? No. I think um, there's some suggestion that it may just take a crisis, a really severe crisis, to prompt this. Um, but that's probably too late. And again, this, this quote comes from the most recent report on the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, they set the Millennium De Development Goals up in 2000. These were supposed to be achieved by 2015. Some have been mentioned before. They are things like reducing, um, reducing hunger, addressing HIV, uh, malaria, improving education, uh, doing gender empowerment. So there are some commitments that were slightly ambitious, probably, but um, not unachievable. However, are they going to be achieved? Probably not. Um, movement has been made towards meeting some of them, but we will fall short, and that needn't have happened. And this is the point that's being made. This was not because it wasn't achievable, it's not because the time was too short, but because states continue not to fulfill their commitments, they don't give the resources that they promised to, and they just show insufficient interest in sustainable development. So in this case, what needs to be done? So uh, again, due to my particular international focus, so states need to change their attitudes and behaviour. They need to convert their commitments into action. It requires leadership. I recognise it's a very difficult thing for national governments to do. It's going to be very unpopular with your electorate. If you uh, start pursuing the longer term goals, you may get thrown out of power. Um, this is sort of inherent in short-term de democratic systems that you go, you pursue short-term goals, you want to show that you will have grown the economy in five years' time, not in 20. Um, you want to show that you're pursuing the interests of your citizens, not the interests of humanity. Furthermore, and has been picked up on before, it requires action from civil society. It, will, uh, it could usefully benefit from improved coordination between developing countries, and I particularly mean within international processes and international negotiations. Um, if they can work as a block, they have more uh, chance of balancing the power of other states. Uh, they also can, as a block, uh, put blocks on negotiations. This is happening in the uh, trade system, for example. Um, however, that is extremely difficult to do again. Um, there's a sort of divide and rule system going on. Um, strong states can put enormous pressures, particularly trade pressures, on developing states, uh, persuading them to back down on some of their demands. We also need, though, to have increased transparency in international negotiations. So that, um, again, particularly in the trade area, a lot has gone on behind closed doors before you even get to the negotiating table. Um, these are meetings that not all countries can get to or get their representatives to. So this, this fits in with the next point, that we need more equal representation of developing countries in international forums. Now, technically, international forums do represent each nation equally. Um, however, if you're a developing nation, you can probably not afford to be sending more than one or two people to each international forum. You may only actually afford to have a couple of people in Geneva who have to deal with several different issues in several different forums. And again, when there are these complex negotiations going on, that means you can't be in all the rooms in all the negotiations. Um, and again, this is something that states have committed to in international treaties. They've said we will provide the additional financial resources to ensure that there is equal rep uh, more equal representation. And it's not happening. This last point is, is really what I see from coming from civil society is a sort of moral pressure. Um, when I say these are, there are these massive gaps between commitments and actions. It should be clear, uh, clear um, 
and easy to try and start shaming some countries into, about this. Um, so that's where I see a key role coming there. I just want to slightly separate off from this general what needs to be done to looking at what I think the scientific community can contribute. Um, and these are some suggestions from Agenda 21. The scientific community can have particular roles in the promotion and education of training and scientists, strengthening scientific infrastructure, and so on. And I, I think the important thing to note is this is something the scientific community is taking on and has taken on. Um, but on its own, without the government support, it can only get so far. Okay, I think I'm doing fine for time, but I'm getting towards the end anyway. Um, my conclusion, unfortunately, is, is perhaps a little pessimistic. But the fact is the major impediments to timely and effective state action for moves towards sustainable development remain strong. If management of innovation compatible with sustainable development is achieved, I'm like, I think it's going to take many more years, many decades probably. And this will be too late for many people. It may be too late for all of us. Um, to return to what I see is the, the moral dimension of this. And this is a summary from a previous paper that dealt with some of these issues. So despite this long-standing concern in the international community, and in fact, while its sustainable development concerns maybe go back 40 years, it has had longer development concerns. So we're talking, we can talk 50, 70 years that things have been being articulated and not acted upon. And yes, I do think this is morally an unacceptable situation. Um, we already have the wealth, knowledge and resources to be meeting the basic needs of all, and yet still millions are dying, millions more are ill and unable to fulfill their potential. Um, and again, not just me saying this, this is um, keeping the promise. So this was not the report on progress with Millennium Development Goals, but it was a, another report by the UN Secretary General. He's trying to shame uh, states into action. Um, and I think the point I want to end on, um, there was some mention that this uh, New Earth Summit may take place in two years' time. Um, I really don't want to see another declaration. Grand declarations have been made before. Um, what states need to do is go back and look at the commitments they have made and start acting on them. Thank you. Which will get picked up in the uh, discussion after coffee. Now, we have three speakers, the panel speakers, who are going to have only 10 minutes each. Um, we're nicely on time at the moment, so that's great. Let's keep it that way. Um, as they say, John Harris, I guess, needs no introduction, but uh, is, in fact, the, of course, a leading bioethicist, uh, joint editor-in-chief of the Journal of Medical Ethics, uh, very much in, involved in medical ethics as well, and he directs the Institute for Science, Ethics, and Innovation, in addition to all his other duties at the University of Manchester. John. Oh, your title is, um, sorry. No, no, you, you're, you're, you're all right. Because um, I'm dead intent to speak to it. Uh, not least because I gave that title when I didn't realize that I would be giving a presentation yesterday uh, substituting for Dan Brock. So what I just would like to do is to point to some ambiguities that have arisen, for me anyway, during this meeting. Um, and I'm not going to try to resolve them against my normal practice of always coming to firm conclusions. And I hate to suggest that I might be following David and asking more questions than I'm prepared to provide answers. But I think one question that I do know the answer to, and that we need always to ask, in order to resolve the ambiguities that I'm about to point to, is what is the point of a green agenda? And there are two possible answers to that question. One is sustainability, which we've had defined for us just now. Um, and the second is a better environment. And it's, that's an irredeemably moral idea. But that raises the question, is greener necessarily better? And it's not clear to me either what greener actually means in most contexts, or whether, even if we know what it means, that that actually is a necessarily better sort of an environment. And partly this comes out from the ambiguity. So if we ask what is to be greened, there are lots of 
possible answers, some of which I talked about yesterday, namely human individuals, human nature, uh, and more generally human society. And then, of course, we need to unpack that into the industrial and commercial and social practices of that society, which includes cars, trains, planes, phones, computers, and so on. And is the name of the game to green those items or to get rid of them because they're not green? And you might give either of those two, two answers. And lurking also behind all of this is this horrible commitment, I think insane, irrational commitment to what's natural. And the idea that what's natural is necessarily better than things that are contrasted with the natural, which might be the artificial or synthetic, or they might be the perverted, or they might be something else. So if we think about the natural in terms of the environment, everybody is in favor of a natural environment. But what is that? Firstly, is it a built environment, or is it an organic environment? And even if we're thinking about the natural environment, we have problems. What is a natural landscape? Is it, as we have a lot of in the United Kingdom, fields and hedges, pasture and forest, or is it wilderness? And within those sorts of distinctions, is a hedge superior to a fence, or is a fence superior to a wall as part of that environment, and what might make it so? And then there is the question of what are the inhabitants of these environments, whether built or natural. And I alluded to that this morning. Um, we have lots of living creatures, plants, animals, insects, and so on. Many of them are domestic or domesticated. Are they green? Are they less green than wild-type plants or wild animals? It's not clear to me that they are. Um, where does genetic modification come in? Most of our plants and most of our animals are genetically modified. They've been genetically modified by selective breeding over, in most cases, many centuries, many thousands of years in some cases. And they are no less genetically modified than are the products of GM laboratories. Is breeding a better or worse, a greener or a less green technology than genetic engineering? It's not clear to me what the answer to that question is or even how one would arrive at an answer to such a question. And the third thing I want to mention is, again, I, what's something that I think is an irrational commitment, although everybody seems to be committed to it, and that is biodiversity. What is biodiversity and why, if it is, is it good? Why is it better? Um, is it better when the diversity is increased by genetically modified foods, which it certainly has been? They've increased the amount of diversity, not reduced it. Um, or is it better only when it's increased or at least not diminished in some other way? Is synthetic biology uh, and synthetic life forms, which are arriving, a welcome increase to biodiversity, or if they're not, why aren't they? And again, as I mentioned earlier in a question, what about the decrease in biodiversity with the eradication of diseases, bacteria, viruses, and so forth? A question that does interest me is, is the loss of species bad per se? Is the world worse if there are fewer species? And if so, why? Is it better if there are more species of things, of plants, of animals? And if so, why? It's clearly not better for having more species of deadly viruses or more species of deadly diseases, at least as far as humans and probably as far as farm animals for food and plants are concerned. 